So let's recap a bit. What we have done is introduced a metric or definition of security called PRF security. It applies to any family of functions and it's defined through a game that allows us to associate to any adversary who plays this game a number called its advantage. The higher the advantage, the better the adversary is doing it, violating PRF security of the family of functions in question, meaning the better is the attack we're mounting. Once we have this metric, we recall that its motivation was as a model or a goal for block ciphers, something that we would like block ciphers to meet or satisfy. And so now we're going to tackle the question of to what extent block ciphers do have PRF security. Maybe before that it's worth a little detour to motivate all of this theory, which someone may be asking themselves uh, why one goes through. We see here again the page about the AES standard. And you see that when they look at some requirements under security, it says the extent to which the algorithm output is indistinguishable from a random permutation on the input block. Well, this is just words for, for PRF security. To be a little more accurate, it's something called PRP security due to the permutation here, but that difference isn't particularly significant for applications. So already at the time they were looking to create the standard, they had in mind PRF security as a goal, which is a pretty strong validation of its importance in practice. And you can also see that if you Google pseudorandom function family, there's a Wikipedia article about it. You can go to Stack Exchange and see people asking questions about it, courses at other universities um, about this, numerous uh, research articles and so forth. Oh, and it looks like um, some UCSD stuff shows up too. It's kind of fun sometimes to look at these stack exchange questions. Here's someone asking, what is the difference between three things, PRG, PRF, and PRP? So pseudorandom functions, random permutation, and pseudorandom generator. And, uh, and there are different kinds of answers provided. Um, this is an interesting question from, from Stack Exchange. Remember that when we measure security of a function family in the PRF metric, the adversary is allowed a certain number of queries to the FN oracle. And as you might expect, the more queries it makes, the greater its advantage might be. Queries helps to break the family of functions. So let k be the number of queries. And um, what this is asking is, is there a way to design something which is a PRF as long as you make just one query, but if you make two queries, then it breaks. And more generally, what about something, a function family, which is very secure as a PRF up to k minus one queries, but once you make the kth query, it breaks for some parameter k, which is embedded in the design. And um, this is a fun thing to play with. You might try this exercise and, and see how that came about. And Stack Exchange has other things, like for example, here's a example function family, and it says show that it's not a PRF. And um, by the way, uh, these questions are posed here and um, they kind of say, I'm, tr I'm trying to do the following assignment. So basically they're getting help with homework problems and things like that. Um, this is similar. It's, it's likely, you know, the question says, I'm new in cryptography and I saw this question in a note, but it's, it's likely a homework problem in a class that maybe someone is trying to get a little help from. Don't try that with this class, we'll be monitoring. Okay, so um, now um, coming back, remember our question of the moment is, how well 
does a block cipher fare as a PRF? Now, of course, the first response one may have is it depends on the block cipher. That's true to some extent, but there's also an extent to which it actually doesn't. There's something inherent going on, inherent limitation, in fact. And to get to that takes us into the birthday problem, which is of independent interest anyway. It actually shows up all over the place in cryptography and also beyond that. And we will see it repeatedly in this class, both as a tool for attacks and as a part of proofs of security and analyses establishing bounds and adversary advantage. Sometimes it's called the birthday paradox because for some people who don't have a um, good grounding in probability theory, it may seem a little counterintuitive. The name comes from the following setting. You have some number Q of people with birthdays, which will denote Y1 through YQ, each birthday being a day of the year, 1 through 365. And we'll assume that people are born on random days. So the Y1 through YQ are randomly and independently distributed in the 1 through 365 range. What I'm interested in is that two or more persons have the same birthday. So um, we call that a collision probability. It's the collision probability for uh, in a set of 365 items when you are picking Q items at random. Another way of writing it is that look at whether the birthdays are all different and the collision event is the opposite of that. So some two are the same, they're not all different. Okay, so now we ask what is the value of this collision probability? And in also how large does Q have to be before that value hits something perceptible, like say one half. This turns out to be um, a question you could, you could ask, say with regard to a class. There's a certain number of people in the room and you want to know, is it likely that two people in the room have the same birthday? Or how many people do you need in the group or in the class before this happens? Now, if you think about this naively, you might think that the collision probability will scale linearly in the number of people, and so it should be around Q divided by 365. And if that's the case, then for this probability to hit around a half, then Q has to be maybe around a half of 365. If that's the case, then you need, what, 180, 190 people in a room before two will have the same birthday. This turns out to not be accurate. And the truth is that the probability grows quadratically in the number of people and inversely in the, in the number of possible birthdays. But that has a rather dramatic impact on how many people need to be in the room before there's a half probability of two of them having the same birthday. The square root of 365 is the answer, roughly and that's only about 23. So, and this is the paradoxical aspect. Although there are 365 days in the year, which seems like a lot compared to 23, according to this estimate, once you have around 23 people in a room, you have a 50% chance that it actually be two of them with the same birthday. Um, you can, there's a formula for this collision probability and you can see how it grows with the number of people so if there are 15 people, there's about a 25% chance that two of them have the same birthday. As that goes up, let's say to 20 people, the chance goes to 41%. 25, it's around 60%. Um, by the time you get to 23, you see you've crossed the threshold of 50%. And then it continues to ramp up with 30 people, 70%. And by the time you get 50 people, there's a 97% chance. But 50 is still quite a bit less than 365. So this is, um, again, showing this um, non-linear and quadratic uh, growth. Okay. Um, now, before we look at this a little more generally and analytically, one might ask um, intuitively, is there some reason that the intuition that 
the birthday collision probability is something like the number of people divided by 365 is incorrect. And perhaps the highest level intuition is that naively one tends to mix up two questions. One question is, I have a room of 40 people or Q people. What is the probability that one of them has the same birthday as me? But that probability does grow linearly in Q. But that's not what we're asking. What we're asking is, what is the probability that there exists some two people, any two, that have the same birthday? And the reason that probability is higher is because there are so many different choices for that pair of people. Okay, now in, crop, in cryptographic applications, we'll be interested in uh, something more general. We imagine we are on a planet which has n days in the year rather than 365, and we're picking birthdays at random from that. Or in fact, they needn't be numbers from one through n, they're just elements in some set which has size big N. In cryptography, often that set is the set of all strings of some length, little n, so big N is 2 to the power little n. Okay, and now uh, C of n q, the collision probability, is the probability that the chosen q points are not all distinct. Two of them are, two or more of them are the same. So we'll be interested in analyzing this, and what the takeaway or the thing to remember is that the collision probability grows roughly as q squared divided by twice the size of the range. Now, it turns out that you can actually exactly compute this probability. So let's start by doing that. So we have um, a formula. So remember, we are picking y1 through yq independently at random from the set of points 1 through n, or more generally, any set of size n. And what we'll do is consider the event that all the y's are distinct. That is the complement of the event we're interested in. Hence, its probability is 1 minus the collision probability. So we're just going to compute 1 minus the collision probability this way. How will we compute the probability that the points are all distinct? We imagine a game which is usually how we like to think about birthdays, and it's called the balls and bins game. So we have n bins and q balls, and we are throwing the balls at ran random into these bins one by one. A collision happens if two balls land on top of another, one another, which means some bin gets more than one ball. So distinctness of means that all the balls land in distinct bins, no bin ends up with more than one ball. So now let's look at it like this. When I throw the first ball, what is the probability that all the balls I've thrown so far are in different bins? Well, it's one, because there's only one ball. There's nothing to hit. Now I have one occupied bin, and I throw the second ball. What is the probability that it lands in a bin different from the one occupied by the first ball, so that my two balls now are, are in different bins. There are n minus 1 empty bins, so that probably is n minus 1 over n. And then we go on. Now there are two bins which have balls in them. I throw my third one. What is the chance it doesn't hit any of the prior ones? It's the chance that it lands in one of the two, uh, one of the n minus 2 empty bins, and so on. And the last ball has this probability of landing in an unoccupied bin. And so uh, we come to this. Now, um, since this was 1 minus the collision probability, we solve for the collision probability this way. OK, now we have this formula, but this formula is actually not that easy to analytically uh, get a sense of just by staring at it. You can, of course, program it up as I did for the uh, table we saw on the last slide, and um, compute values. But um, for estimates, we would also like some kind of simpler formula. Now, if you look at this in intuitively, it's still a little puzzling why its growth rate is at clay as claimed, because think of n as quite big. n minus 1 over n is very close to uh, 1. So is n minus 2 over n and so forth. But the product um, does make a difference. So um, 
some analysis allows us to derive these estimates that um, the collision property for throwing Q items into a set of size n is roughly Q into Q minus 1 over n, or Q squared over n. It's at most 50% of that and at least 30% of that. So up to this constant, um, we have it squashed in between, and hence Q into Q minus 1 over n with a small constant is a good estimate. Now, the fact also puts a limitation on the range of Q for which this is true, only up to about square root of n. Why is that? Well, for one thing, because if otherwise, if you look at this, it'll start getting bigger than 1. So clearly, there has to be some kind of limitation. However, the exact formula on the prior slide doesn't have that limitation. But it doesn't make too much difference, because we will very rarely be interested in Q beyond this, because by the time we get there, this is pretty much hit 1. OK, so now if you further want to play around with birthday probabilities, it turns out on the internet there are birthday probability calculators. So you can, for example, um, look at uh, uh, different parameters. They even allow you to pick whether you want collisions as we have them, or like three-way collisions or things like that. And then they say, pick, let's say, the number of days in the year and the number of people in the group, and um, and then calculate a birthday probability. And so this shows us that it's indeed about 50%, as we saw. But we can change the numbers. We can look at a planet with a 1,000 days per year and uh, see what happens if we put in 80 people and tells us that the probability is about 96%. Oh dear, it doesn't like my ad blocker. Well, too bad. OK, so um, now the birthday problem also has a kind of colorful, fun history. Um, people have used this to bet. You go to a group of people and you say, let's bet on whether someone in this group has the same birthday. And of course, the person who starts this has a good idea of the probabilities, and so can estimate um, the chances of winning quite well, and is hoping that others are more naive and will, um, will take worse odds. So now um, we put that away as a technical fact of reference and come back to PRFs. And here I've simply recalled the game. But we now have a particular question. We're given a block cipher E with k-bit keys and l-bit blocks. And I want to know how well it fares as a PRF. We've seen this type of question before in an example. And what it asks you to do is put on your attacker hat and see if you can design an adversary for which, when you compute the advantage, it's fairly high. And the adversary should use as few resources, which means number of queries and running time as possible. So at first, this seems um, not possible because I haven't even told you what the block cipher is. It could be DES, it could be AES, anything else. But you don't have a description. And nonetheless, I want to claim that you can design some kind of non-trivial attack. So why is that possible? Because we know that being a block cipher means that once you fix a key, the function e sub k induced by it is a permutation. And now remember that in the game, in the real game, what the adversary has access to through the fn oracle is e sub k. So the key k is fixed and it's making multiple queries to one e sub k. So what will we notice about the values returned? As long as the queries made are distinct, let's call them x1 through xq, the answers have to be distinct as well, because it's a permutation, and so no distinct inputs can map to the same output. OK, but what about in the uh, random game? There, this oracle is underlined by a random function, which means that if you make distinct queries, each time you get back a random L-bit string. 
But random strings are not necessarily distinct. There's some even if small probability that they will that you pick the same string as before when you pick one. And so we see a difference, and that difference can be turned into a test and thus into an attack. So let's give that attack. As usual, it's an adversary specified in pseudocode, and we have to uh, we we'll ask it to pick some q distinct blocks which can be input to the block cipher. It doesn't matter what they are as long as they're distinct. And then it queries each one of them uh, one by one to its oracle. Remember it has access to this oracle and it needs to query that as part of its attack and its goal is to tell now whether these y sub i's are coming back from this case the real world or the, from this the random one. How does it do that? It knows that if it was in the real world, they would all be distinct. So if they are distinct, it bets on the real world. Okay. But if not, it says, okay, I'll bet on the random world. Now notice that if they're not distinct, for sure, this is the right answer. But if they are distinct, you could be in either situation. And this is why some analysis is needed. So let's do that analysis. Once we have an adversary we now fixed, we figure out what, is, what are the probabilities that it outputs a 1 in the real world and then the random world. And we do that case by case. Our block cipher is fixed, hence so is the game. Remember it picks a key at random and initialize of length little k. And then this oracle on input x will return the block cipher under key k applied to x. We are interested in when a 1 is returned by the adversary and the code tells us it happens when all the replies from the oracle are distinct. But we now know that um, we are getting replies from uh, a block cipher with a fixed key and we know that that function is a permutation and so for sure these will be distinct because x1 through xq are distinct that is true regardless of the choice of the key, and so this probability is just one. So that is kind of why we wrote down this attack, because we, we expect this to be true. So now let's look at what happens in the other world. We haven't changed the adversary or the block cipher, but we've changed the game. And at this point, actually, the block cipher is irrelevant because this game doesn't even depend on it. The game only depends on the range set, which is the set of L-bit strings. And it's the random game, so it returns a random L-bit string in response to any input. Since the inputs are all distinct, what we're going to get back is Q random independently distributed L-bit strings. So we're still interested in the probability that a 1 is returned, and that happens if all these strings are distinct. And so that tells us that the probability that the random game returns 1 is the probability that all these strings are distinct. Now, if we had hit this um, with no warning or preparation, we might have scratched our heads about figuring out the probability that these Q strings are all distinct, because it may not have looked like a simple calculation. You have Q independently distributed L-bit strings. But now we recognize that this is just our friend the birthday problem. This is in fact not the birthday collision event, but it's complement. But we know a formula that tells us its probability is 1 minus c applied to what? It takes two arguments. One is the size of the set from which these are drawn. So what is the size of that set? Well, we're drawing L-bit strings at random. So there are two to the L of such possibilities. That's the size of the set. And the second is Q, the number of things we draw. Okay, so and at this point we'll simply leave it in terms of this quantity and go ahead and compute the advantage. So again with our fixed block cipher and this particular adversary, we get an advantage by subtracting those two probabilities. So it's 1 minus what we just computed and we're left with just this. And so we have kind of this simple quite elegant formula that the PRF advantage of our adversary is exactly the collision probability for throwing Q 
cue balls into two of the L bins. Now that's an exact calculation, but it's not much use as an estimate. So now we apply the fact we saw earlier to lower bound it by 30% of q into q minus 1 over 2 to the L. Why do we do that? Because once we have this, we, we see that once q starts hitting 2 to the power half of L, this starts getting to be very close to 1. So our conclusion now roughly is that if you make a number of queries, which is 2 to the power half of the block size, the PRF advantage of this adversary starts getting very significant. Okay, so that's the bottom line. And um, from the point of view of classical cryptography and cryptanalysis, this would have been quite significant or novel, not in the sense that they couldn't have figured it out if they wanted to, but rather that it wouldn't necessarily have been viewed as as um, interesting or relevant. But f given our perspective that a good block cipher should behave like a PRF, and assuming we agree with and adopt that perspective, this shows us that the extent to which block ciphers behave like PRFs is can be a lot lower than we, we think. So one of the novel elements of this is we find that now security depends on the block length of the block cipher, not merely the key length. Of course, it also depends on that. But in fact, uh, this particular attack creates a dependency on block length. So let's see the implications. Well, for DES, the block length is 64. So the birthday attack succeeds in time 2 to the 32, which is a fairly small number. And we don't want to view uh, that as being secure. So we would declare that to be insecure. Now remember that in order to offset the exhaustive key search attacks, we have introduced things like double and triple DES. And triple DES at least did pretty well from the point of view of resistance to key recovery and to differential and linear cryptanalysis. But both of these leave the block length at 64. So the resistance to the birthday attack is no better than for DES. And so we are forced to declare them to be insecure as well. For AES, the block length is a 128. So the birthday attack takes 2 to the 64 time. Now, even that is less a lot less than the time for key recovery attacks. But 2 to the 64 feels like a large enough number that we're going to think of that as OK. And, um, and applications can live within that and tolerate that. Now, um, at this point, some of this may feel kind of abstract in the sense that we've given this birthday attack, which shows that you can violate PRF security but why does that matter? It hasn't, what has it done that's actually damaged our privacy or any other cryptographic goal that we care about? In fact, as we'll see later, that, that it does do that. Birthday attacks do uh, end up violating privacy. And in particular, triple DES has been retired due to the discovery of, uh, or at least due to the, um, implementation of certain attacks that use this birthday attack to actually uncover information about encrypted data. And that was kind of the nail in the coffin for, for something like this. So it isn't something merely theoretical. It's somehow the right way to be looking at things. But we'll get to that when we study encryption. All right, so we now have this new metric of PRF security. and. One of the um, sort of important themes in cryptography, at least in the way we're approaching it in modern cryptography, is the study of these metrics and definitions. And it behoves us to, to continue that a little and understand that metric a little better. And one basic question that arises there is we now have two metrics. We already saw the key recovery metric, and that said that it should be hard to find the target key or at least a key consistent with input-output examples. And now we have PRF security. And um, we did say 
that we don't want to dump KR security. It's important to have it because otherwise there's a very big weakness. It just was a, not enough. And so we, uh, we went to PRF security. But I want to view PRF security as kind of the only thing we need to worry about. And one way that's justified is to say that if you come up with other things you think are important, it's likely that PRF security simply implies them. And in particular, we're going to discuss that claim with regard to key recovery security. So the claim is that when you have PRF security of some family of functions, you don't have to worry about key recovery security. You automatically have that as well. And that is one of the reasons that we can restrict attention to this one metric. It's a kind of um, master property in that sense. Furthermore, it isn't just key recovery security. There are many other security attributes of a family of functions you could consider that end up simply being implied by PRF security. So if you remember when we started this, we talked about how you could write a list of these attributes. Does E sub K of M reveal M? Does it reveal half of M? PRF security will say that the answer to all these questions is no. Somehow all these security properties are simply consequences of PRF security. Now, we could spend quite some time validating that at a general level, but um, instead we're going to look at the specific case of key recovery security. And that takes us to our first example of a reduction uh, and a proof by reduction. So we have a theorem which informally says PRF security implies key recovery security, but in fact it quantifies that statement and that enables us to see to what extent it actually is true. So it works as follows. We fix some family of functions k bit keys, n bit inputs, l bit outputs. It might be a block cipher, but it doesn't have to be a block cipher. Now, how, now our claim is that PRF security implies key recovery security. And the way we uh, formulate that is assume we are handed some adversary B attempting to violate KR security. So it makes some number of queries to its oracle, Fn, now, we somehow want to say, I'm assuming E is a PRF, and that should tell me that this B is not going to do too well. Its advantage is going to be relatively small. How do I show that? Given B, I construct a PRF adversary A. That makes Q queries to its um, FN oracle, and this relation is true between the advantages. If you compute the KR advantage of B, it's at most the PRF advantage of A plus a quantity that we should think of as being kind of small. So this says that whatever probability you have of violating KR security, it can't be much more than your chance of violating PRF security. So, um, so here's how you can qualitatively implement, uh, interpret it. Thinking that E is PRF secure means what? It means that the PRF advantage of A is small. But assuming this is also small, the equation then tells us that the key recovery advantage of B is small. And that means E is KR secure. So this is how we see this as establishing this qualitative consideration. Now there are lots of um, more quantitative things one can get into. For example, what is this formula? It's 2 to the power the key length minus the number of queries times the output length. Okay. So key and output length are usually fixed. For example, for DES, this is 56, 64. AES, it's 128, 128. So as you ramp up Q, this starts decreasing very, very quickly. So for example, if, if, um, if you're looking at AES, where K and L are 128. If I set Q to be 2, then this is 2 to the negative 128. And that's why in estimates like this, I said it's negligible. We basically just assume it's 0 because a small increase in Q will quickly make that true. 
but 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 it is a term that actually exists. It's important that the running time of A is very close to that of B, um, so that these um, estimates don't end up uh, being somehow compensated for by by too high a running time. Okay. Um, so part of the message here is the statement of the proposition and part is the proof. And we're going to look at the proof as a first example of a reduction, but it's nice first to kind of mull over the statement and make sure one understands it. The statement is saying, if you hand me B, I build A, such that a certain equation holds. This number is capturing quite a lot. It's running B in the KR game and computing a certain advantage. This is completely different. It's running a different adversary in a different game and computing the advantage. But nonetheless, the theorem says these two numbers are related to each other. Okay, And we'll have to see how that works. And it's going to be done uh, by what we call a reduction. And you'll be doing a bunch of these in, in homework. So this will be a, a good example for that. Okay, so now let's go on towards um, establishing the result. And we'll begin by recalling the definitions. So remember that B is playing the key recovery game. And remember the way that game works is as follows. So I've simply copied down the text of the game. But since it's a while since we saw it, initialize picks a random target key and sets a counter to zero. The adversary gets to call the fn oracle on a message m, which is a n-bit string in our setting. And it will be returned the result of the family of functions e on the hidden key applied to the message on which it called. And these messages will be stored inside the game through this indexing. When the adversary is ready, after it's made all its Q queries, it says, I think I know what K is. Here's my guess k prime as to the value of k. And the game will check whether the adversary is correct or not, but under a consistency metric. It will declare the adversary be true if k prime is consistent with all the input out output examples m sub i c sub i that have been seen so far. So if the family of functions under the adversary provided key and message fails to match this, in other words, fails to match E under the real key and the same message, then um, the adversary lost. If they all match up, it won. We also insist that all queries are distinct because um, it's more meaningful to talk about Q queries when you do that. And this is relatively simple to ignore because we just assume our adversary does make uh, distinct queries. Okay, so that's just a recall, and the advantage is the probability that um, this returns true. Remember, we are handed a B playing this game, uh, and now we turn to the other element, which is that we need to design an A which has a comparable PRF advantage. But this A is playing a completely different set of games. Again, we just recall them, we saw them not too long ago, uh, it's trying to tell whether it's in the real or random game. In the real game, a, a target key is chosen at random, and the oracle given an input m responds with e and k and m, which is the same as it would do in the key recovery game. But in the random game, the oracle of the same name given a message just returns random things. And the advantage now has a different form. It's the difference between the probabilities of returning one in the two games. So what is our task? We need to build an adversary A that has a high advantage. Okay, So we have seen examples where we looked at a family of functions and asked, is this PRF secure? And then we demonstrated that it wasn't or wasn't to whatever extent we could demonstrate by giving an adversary in pseudocode. We, we came up with attacks, and those attacks tried to violate PRF security. Take the same perspective here. If I have to build an adversary A here violating PRF security, I'm trying to give an attack. 
so I would need a pseudocode describing how this attack works. Okay, so at that level, it's the same game. What's the difference is that I don't know what E does. It's an abstract family of functions. Now, I can compute it. You can assume it's public and have code for it, but I have no understanding uh, of what it's doing mathematically. Also, and given that in particular, it's not clear how I'm going to start attacking E. So what is it that allows A to do this? It's that it knows that there's a way to violate KR security. And hence, at a very high level, it's going to adopt a very simple strategy. It's going to say, I will run adversary B and use it to find the key. If it can find the key, I must be in the real game. Otherwise, I must be in the random game. Okay, so this is what we want to do. However, um, when we start doing it, we run into things we have to deal with. So here's our adversary A. It initializes some stuff, we'll worry about that later. But the main thing is that it runs B to get a key K prime. Okay, why does that work? Because we know that the key recovery adversary will find a key. Ignore for the moment this superscript and assume B returns a key K prime. We will now check as part of A whether this was successful or not. There will be some input output examples created in some way and adversary A checks whether the key supplied by B is consistent with them. If it's not, it sets D to zero and otherwise D is one and then it'll return D. So in other words, if consistency happens, it bets it's in the real world, otherwise in the random world. Okay, but we have a complication. What does it mean to run B like this? Adversary A is some piece of code. It's going to run B internally, either by having copied over the code or just making subroutine calls or whatever. But B thinks it's playing the key recovery game. And as part of that, it thinks it has access to an Oracle FN which when called with M returns E of K and M, where K is the target key. If A starts running B, the first thing B will do is trundle along for a while and then say, okay, here's my first Oracle query. But B isn't in the KR game. What is going to happen now with this query? The answer is if A wants B to continue to its finish and output K prime, A is itself forced to supply an answer to that query. And this is called simulating B's oracle. And that is done via subroutine, and that subroutine is here. Now with that subroutine, B executes, and it will output something. How does the subroutine work? Very simple. It just uses A's or FN oracle as B's uh, oracle. Remember, A itself has an oracle called FN, which arises in both the real and the random worlds. When B makes a query M, what the subroutine will do is call A's FN Oracle on M and return the reply. But it will also do some bookkeeping. It will store the message as M sub I. Okay, we now know what these M sub J's here are. And we see that this test is exactly the test made by the key recovery game. So again, intuitively, check whether B finds the key if that key is correct, it's consistent with these input-output examples. Bet on it being the real world, otherwise bet on it being the random world. Fine, so at this point we have A, but we still need to analyze it and show that that equation holds. So we do that um, in the real world first, coming up with the probability of returning one there, then in the random world. So let's, let's compute the advantage of A. We start with the real world analysis. Remember there, initialize picks a random key. The procedure returns the, the family of functions of interest under that key applied to M. Now, notice that what happens to the subroutine that A provides to B in this case? The subroutine is just calling this. So the subroutine is simply returning E k of M. But that's perfect because B is getting the same responses it would in the key recovery game. From B's perspective, 
the world is functioning exactly as it expects and it has no clue that A is running it and it's not real running in a real game. So it will output K prime, which will be consistent with the input output examples it sees with whatever probability it would in the actual key recovery game. And since A returns a one, when K prime is consistent with this, A returns a one, uh, the probability that A returns a one is exactly the success probability of being the key recovery game or its advantage. Right? So we obtain that the probability that A returns a one in the real game is the key recovery advantage of B. And so now we've established a connection and it's worth noticing that these, both of these things involve probabilities in completely different experiments. This is a game played by B in a standalone way. This is one played by A running B in its environment. We're just saying, nonetheless, numerically, these two things are equal. Okay, but we're not yet done. We need to figure out also what is the probability that A returns a 1 in the random game because that's part of the advantage of A. Now, this is where things get a little weird. In this game, A hasn't changed. It's still running B and it's still providing B a subroutine, which in fact is just whatever Fn oracle A has. But A's Fn oracle is now different. It just returns random stuff. Uh, and we can assume the queries are distinct, so they're random independent things. Well, what would happen to B when you start giving it back random stuff instead of things of the form E of K and M? Well, we don't really know. It's not what B expects. It's never, there's never been any guarantee or statement about what happens to B except inside the KR game. And now it's not in the KR game. It's, it's receiving replies to Oracle queries, which are kind of different and novel. And it may not like them. Who knows what it's going to do? Will it return a key consistent with input output examples? Who knows? There's no guarantee it'll do that. Um, but it is okay to assume that it returns something. We can always ensure that it has an output. So we'll continue to assume it makes Q queries and it outputs something. Now, we claim that the probability of A returning a 1 in the random world is at most this formula. Again, remember, we think of this as small because Q is large enough and K and L are kind of close to each other. Remember that this event happens when the key that B outputs, the key K prime, is consistent with whatever input-output examples were provided to B through this, which in turn is this. So there are still input-output examples. Consistency is still being checked. And that determines whether or not A returns 1. If I want to show that this is small, in some sense, intuitively, I can think of it as follows. You think of B as being unfriendly. It's trying to say, I want A to fail. How can I make it fail? Well, it starts getting back replies from these Oracle queries. And maybe it starts noticing something is amiss. These don't look like things coming from a block cipher or a family of functions E. They look weird. So I'm going to make sure that I uh, output a consistent key here just the same way I did before so that A uh, fails to distinguish the real world from random. So B is trying to maximize the chance of outputting a consistent key. It's trying to make A output one um, with the highest possible probability but it's going to fail. And, and the claim there is interesting because I want to claim that B fails regardless of what it does. Somehow it doesn't matter. It can be as devious as it wants. It just will not find a consistent key. Why will it not find a consistent key? Because I claim with high probability one simply doesn't exist. Okay? It's not a question of finding. There just isn't one. And intuitively, that's the case because we are looking at random ciphertexts. 
and trying to find a key consistent with messages when ciphertexts are random um, isn't possible because there's unlikely to be such a key. And the reason is that there are very few keys compared to number of ciphertexts. Now we'll go through that a little more, a bit more carefully. So I want to compute that probability, the probability that A returns a 1. So let's do a little probability theory first. Take a string or a key k prime of length k and associate to it the following event. The event is that when you evaluate E on this key k prime on the messages which have been queried by B, you get back the ciphertext that the f and oracle returned and are going back to b. In other words, k prime is consistent with our list of input output examples. Okay, so this event is about a specific key k prime, for example, the string of all zeros. We now know what it means for that key to be consistent. This event asks that that key be consistent with all input output examples. Now, consider the event that some key exists that is consistent with all the input output examples, right? S is an event which says there is a K, KK prime, such that this thing holds. Now I first claim that the advantage in which I'm interested in is at most the probability of S. In other words, if I can bound the probability of S, I will have bounded the advantage the probability that A returns 1 in the random world. Why is that? Because if there is no such key, meaning S does not happen, there is no way that A can return a 1. Because there simply is no way to create a consistent key. Okay, So bounding S, this probability will, will bound the probability that A returns 1 in the random world. And now we just have a probability task. How do we bound this? Well, you remember the union bound, which says that I can, since S is the union over K prime of all these events, the probability of S is the sum over all K prime of the probabilities of these individual events. There are two to the K items in the sum. And now, what is the probability of an individual event S of K prime? There are Q message ciphertext pairs. In each of them, the ciphertext is simply random. In this event, k prime and m sub i are fixed. M m m1 to m2 and so forth are all fixed. So this quantity is predefined, and I'm picking this at random. What's the chance of a match? It's 2 to the minus l. Remember that l is the output length. And that has to happen q times, and they're all independent. So you have this chance of one of these events um, happening and that gives us our formula okay now there's quite a lot going on there and it's worthwhile kind of going back over it and uh, making sure you understand the calculations and the details and things like that but overall what we've done then to recap is showed that PRF security implies key recovery security now moving on uh, we are going to want to use block ciphers as tools and building blocks for higher level schemes that provide privacy and integrity. And those will rely on PRF security of the block ciphers. And so I want block ciphers that have PRF security. And we don't have proofs that ones we know do. And we are going to assume simply that things like DES and AES are good block ciphers. Of course, when we say good, it's simply to whatever extent is possible. And that means up to the inherent limitation of the birthday attack. Due to that, of course, DES is quite poor as a PRF, but it's nonetheless effectively as, as good as possible. And AES, AES is, is pretty good. So moving forward, have that intuition about what AES is. It's a good PRF and use that in design and analysis. But nonetheless, beware that it's simply an assumption and future cryptanalysis could prove that to be wrong. Okay, so this is a little exercise to, to see um, uh, and test or exercise your understanding of the PRF notion. 
where you're given a bunch of designs and asked to explore there whether they are PR secure or not. Okay, and let's stop there.